counselor and a family coach and um and interventionist nice well welcome back i always loved having you on and i think i we started this together and we're ending it together right i think you're right yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right yeah you're absolutely right oh this is yeah. this is kind of sad <laughs> is. we started right in the midst of the pandemic when everybody was trapped at home and Unfortunately, we lost traction after the world opened up again, which is why this is our final. I lost traction on um, my life after the world opened up again. <laughs> integrating back into real life has been tough for a lot of us. Um, but for those of you out there, just so you know, we will be, um, Heron Project and myself are going to be moving towards doing some podcasts. So stay tuned for that. And Maureen will absolutely be a guest, hopefully, as long as she accepts and have her on as a reoccurring guest over the next year or so um so we're not ending it we're just transitioning into um, a medium that seems to have caught more volume more people so so anyways um we are open for questions so this is a lunch and learn you guys can throw your questions at us if you are on uh facebook just put your question right in the comments and they will get to us if you are on the zoom platform you can put your questions right in the q a tab that is on your screen please do not put them in the chat everybody can see those please put them in the q a um, and try not to put too much identifying information in them because this is not confidential so so maureen how have you been i've been good i've had a lot go on i'm um, I don't know. A lot of people know my story from the book, from uh, the, If You Love Me. This, it's a story of um, what I went through. What brought me into this is really my story of um, my experience with my daughter and uh, her struggle with addiction. And all the, you know, I remember when she was going through this, she would say, this is all the things that I'm never going to have. And of course, it's a very difficult story, difficult enough that it turned into, you know, a book and that a big publisher published. Um, and, you know, many, many overdoses, 40 plus treatment centers, um, a lot of pain, a lot of Maureen acting like a complete and utter lunatic. And um, a lot of education, I just educated myself and educated myself to become the person that I needed when I was going through this. And here I am doing lots of good work, I think, with other people and helping them. But um, in the, you know, all these, that time that she was going through this, she used to say to me, I will never, um, I'll never have a home, I'll never have a car, I'll never finish college, I'll never do any of these things. No one's ever going to want to marry me or have a, I'm never going to have a good relationship. I'll never have children. And she has all of those things. And she just topped it off with um, a beautiful baby girl five weeks ago. So I've been enjoying that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I en enjoying to telling people how well she's doing, because I think it gives a lot of people hope because when you read the book, I wrote the book as I was going through it. And, um, you know, and it's a tough read at times. And it ends as she comes out of her last treatment center, the hardcover does anyhow. And um, I didn't know it was the last one. It was she'd gone into in and out of 40 of them. So um, as it ends, um, you know, a lot of people wonder well, what happened to all those people that you talked about, what happens to your daughter and um it's so awesome to be able to say that this is this is what happens because people get well and and Maureen I, I mean for you guys out there I am not just saying this because Maureen is here I say it behind her back all the time the book is awesome um so if you're looking for a real story it's real you, and you get can get real. in the library too I always tell people I promise you I'm not trying to sell my book right um <laughs> it's in the library you could always find it but it is it's like a, it's a it's what really people go through and mm -hmm. people tell me all the time oh you told my story it's like it's because it's all of our stories we all do the same crazy so stuff we feel the same way we we're, our heart breaks in the same way we're not that much different our children are not that much different and we're not that much different. No. Well, and that's because I was, I've been showing my groups um, the study that comes out of the University of Texas that you actually introduced me to, which is incredibly important when we're talking about this, right? Our brains get sick, just like our loved ones' brains get sick. And it's being proven that mm -hmm. our brains react in the same way 
when we think about saving our loved one from substance use disorder as their brains react when they're thinking about their drug. Yes. So it's and very I true. Was sick. I was this one of the sickest people I've encountered. I've and I, you know, deal with some people that are pretty hard hit by this. And I was the queen. Yeah. Without a doubt. Oh, I wish I could have met you then. <laughs> you would have had your hands full. <laughs> I needed you actually. I I wish my I favorite. Is it my favorite families to work with are the ones that are really willing though to to listen and to do the work and to do the learning and to get educated because it just has the best results right and and most of the time what what you and I will say because we often say very much the same things people have a hard time hearing because it's really hard to implement right and that's but your proof that it's what works right it really, and it really does it really I just want to throw out there too, Maureen, that one of the things that I'm starting to recognize, there's a lot of really good movies out, you know, that show what it's like to be an active addiction, right? You should do the follow-up because I want to start seeing what it's like in recovery, right? right I right. want the follow-up. I want to see what happens in the first year because I'm starting to recognize that a lot of people aren't prepared for the first year. Oh my God. I like saying that. I was just, this is what I want. This is going to be the next book. Absolutely. Oh, that's how awesome. to transform into the, because we become our whole identity becomes not even just the person in recovery, but my whole identity became this, this, like this crazy person, you know what I mean? And who am I, if I'm not doing that, mm -hmm. I had to reinvent myself. I had to be someone different. And mm -hmm. even as I did this, I had to not be the person that was frantically doing this, which that took a while too. Once I figured I could help people, I was like a maniac helping people. And yep. it's like, how do we become this person that's had this experience that grew from it and now has learned so many things and maybe can share some of that? Or maybe that's not what we do at all. Maybe we're just done with this and that's okay too. Right, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, wherever wherever families end up, that's okay. I, I just think that first year, is something that needs to be talked about more because most of the time families think that if I can just get them into treatment, if we could just get them sober, everything's going to be okay. And that first year hits them like a train, like a freight train, right? Because that first year is so hard. So I want to start talking about this a little bit. Um, we're actually going to be partnering. We are partnering with a documentary that's coming out that's called Our American Family. And that's it's kind of what it shows is... Um, that first year and how hard it oh, is not oh only God. for the lo our loved one but also for us right it's such a transition it's for everything that you just said but also the they're not well for that first year and we think they're going to be right once the drugs wear off they're just going to be fine well, and people what would say that? people would say no, i bet you can breathe a sigh of relief now it was right. like no, it took me like five years to realize yeah. that I could be, I could breathe a sigh of relief. Right. And it's, um, you know, and even then some, I have, I have had my moments, but I, I, I had to be a different person too. It wasn't just her that had to, you know, that was in recovery. I had to have my own recovery yeah. and nobody talks about that. And then we have a lot of people that stay in that and they make their loved ones sick. Mm -hmm. because they're we're all filling these roles right we're all being this is who I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be ever vigilant I've got to watch you all the time that's mm -hmm. that's not a healthy relationship and that's not what anybody wants no not at all nope and then you throw on top of it the fact that their nervous system is still healing six months to a year for the brain to heal post-acute withdrawals which is another thing that shocks me that people a lot of the treatment centers are still not really talking about enough. The fact that most of our loved ones, the withdrawals don't end when that acute means, you know, the, the, the short phase of when the body is no longer addicted to the drug, right? Those withdrawals do go away, but then there are withdrawal symptoms that can last for six months to a year, like no sleeping, right? Like serious depression, severe anxiety. There's all of these things that happen and sometimes brain snaps. I don't know if you guys, you know, if any of you have heard of this, but it's like, they'll just lose moments of time and they don't know. Sometimes they actually feel like they feel like their brain is snapping like that. 
that word really like they feel like it's it's snapping so there's a lot of things that are going on neurologically and this idea that somebody is going to be completely de detoxed in five to seven days after decades of hard drug use um it's just not reality and it's not biology and we know that now we need to talk about it more right and it's the same, it's the same for parents, right? So if you were a prisoner of war, which I always feel like kind of a hostage situation, prisoner of war, that's kind of how I felt while I was going through this, right? So if you lived in that high stress environment where you never knew when the next thing was going to hit you, um, and you and then you were, and we saw what this what happened to people when this when these things actually happened, and then they went home, well. They're not the next day playing softball and going to work. And so it takes time yeah. and nobody, nobody talks about that for mm -hmm. parents either. Yet we're supposed to then automatically adapt into this person who is now a parent of a person in recovery and have a whole and be a whole different person all over again. It's not possible. We need help with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of families who have been where you were right in the depths of of sub active substance use for years and now their loved one comes out of treatment and is now sober and they are like what is wrong with me this should be the happiest time of my life why is this so awful and they actually feel more crazy than they did before right right and and we got to name that we got to start saying that that's a common experience it happens to almost every family i've ever worked with regardless of regardless of what your role is, it happens to spouses, it happens to siblings, it happens to parents, it happens to all of us. When we have been trying to save somebody's life for so long, and all of a sudden, they're, we're, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's the trauma, right, that you just mentioned. Yeah. You're just, you're waiting to, for the, you know, the car backfires and you're jumping on the ground because you think the bullets are about to come. And all it was, was they slept a little late, they missed their alarm that one day, <laughs> right? But to us, it's like, that the world is ending. And that's how a lot of people are, are living their lives in the first six months. And it's really hard um, to make that transition and to work through that trauma. Now, uh, you know, how did, what did you do during that time to take care of yourself? Like, how did, what did you do to help you help with that? I, st I started, I think before, and I think that this was key before she really made that, that, that turn, I started to see that this was not mine to fix that I had no control over it. The control was an illusion. All the things I was doing, the catching, the, all that kind of stuff, the, the vigilance, all of that stuff was an illusion. It wasn't helping. And I started to understand that. I think part of it was just exhaustion. But the other was that I started to really try to educate myself. And I started to see that I was making all these poor decisions because I was, I was suffering as well and had you know that ptsd and all the trauma and stuff was making me causing me to make some really just bad decisions and um i think that i started to realize that people told me you have to take care of yourself you have to take care of yourself and i thought to myself you know what you take care of yourself i'll take care of myself and my daughter's well and um and of course that's you know that's like sounds like something any parent would say but that's just that's not healthy and because I was so unhealthy I was not able to be that rock that strong stable source of good information and logical decisions and that's what I needed to be so I started to make some of those changes but I had to learn that this was not mine to fix and when I started to let go of that a little bit not of her and and to start to encourage her because I really, truly do believe that people rise to the level of your expectations. Mm -hmm. And I started to say, I, you know, everything she did, she had been to so many places, you know what to do. I know in my heart that you're going to be okay. I'm scared that something bad's going to happen in between because there's that element of, of bad luck that hits so many of our kids and we lose them before they have the opportunity to get well. But um, I, I would say to her, I know that you can do this. I believe in you. I'm here for you and um, but I can't do it for you and I'm going to stop trying because I, I get it now yeah, yeah. and I gave and it back to her. 
and nobody tried harder than you. Uh, if any of you have an opportunity to read Maureen's book, I mean, she was literally kidnapping her daughter and holding her down in the back of, of, of was it a station wagon? Is that what it was? An SUV. An SUV. Yeah. Then I started an opioid response team in my neighborhood, in my town, thinking that I know what I'll do. I'll get everybody that uh, she used with into treatment, which I think I did. <laughs> and then she won't have anybody to use with. I mean, I was just so crazy. Yeah. And um, I mean, you know, but uh, I think that, you know, she started to see that, she started to see that I, I couldn't save her, that I wasn't gonna try to save her and that I was gonna love her regardless. It had, it made no difference whether she was gonna continue to use, I was gonna always be there. I was never going to turn my back on her and um but that I missed her and that I want that everybody wanted her back and that was kind of the the message that it started to evolve into at the, at the end of her use right and um she got a little traction and she did it on her own and she got a job and she got a place to live and she kept putting one foot in front of the other and start and I just kept noticing look you're doing it you're you're like when they're riding a bike you know, yeah. look, you're doing it, you're doing it. And, yeah. you know, it was ugly and bumpy and didn't always look so great. But, um, and with the help of Vivitrol and therapy, that yeah. was the key for her. Two, the two very important tools, very powerful tools. That and I am a big like fan it. of Vivitrol because it does not have an opioid in it and you can stop when you want to stop. Yep. And, but you have to have the willingness, you know, to keep going back every month for it. Right. And um, she went to she went to a therapist that specialized in PTSD and trauma, and she would go sometimes uh, up to three times a week. And I paid for that. So and did I have the money to pay for that? No, I was a single parent, had a bunch of kids, but um, I I figured it out because that was what I felt was I could contribute that because our insurance covered some of it, but at you know insurances at some point it's they stopped covering and. Um, that was, you know, the Vivitrol is a safety net, right? Uh, because yeah. those of those decisions, like, oh my God, I th the whole world is horrible. This is never going to work. I'm going to go use. And in the past, she would have done that, but the Vivitrol was that safety net that um, kept her from being able to do it so easily. Right. It also helps with the craving. So Vivitrol is a great drug. It um, it it makes it so if you do use, you don't get you know, the people won't get the same level of high and it also helps the cravings of wanting to use. So it's a great tool and there is no opiate in it. It is not an addictive substance. I don't know why we're not using it for pretty much everybody that's coming out of treatment. Um, you know, it's, it's class of medication assisted to treatment, MAT, um, which we've changed that name though. Yeah. It's, um, medication for opioid use disorder. Yes. Medication for opioid use disorder, which, I think is very, 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 very helpful. However, we also need to do exactly what you were saying and also focus on the, the other things. It can't just be about the medication, right? You mentioned therapy and Vivitrol. I think therapy is a very important piece yeah. or not, it doesn't have to be traditional therapy, but some form of support system where there's education and learning and understanding of the why, because the why is the most important part of all of this. If people don't find it, figure out why they're using, it's like the foundation that the house was built on. Right? right. If the house is substance use disorder, the why is the foundation. And that came long before the use and, right. we'll and the, have to be figuring that out. And I think the why sometimes may be, um, may, may be something that caught early, you know, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's something, it's something that a lot of people have, but, oh, I notice when, when I smoke pot or when I do some drugs, I, I feel a little bit, you know, able to, and maybe it's not that big of a deal, but then like in her case, and this happens a lot, is the why began as dr the drug use went on, the why got bigger and bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Because more and more horrible traumatic things happen. So people, you know, it's not always trauma, you know, and I that annoys me too, that, you know, they, they want to like stamp it up, oh, that's what it is. Or it's, um, you know, they're not connected to anybody. Well, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes there's something that makes, and then the drug use catches hold and then there becomes more and more things that make it harder and harder to stop. 
and more and more likely that the person's going to reach to that thing that fixed the initial problem. When, oh, we're wired. We're wired to move towards right. things that make us feel better. And this is why prevention is so important because we have to help our young people learn how to cope with life is difficult. I wish I could, you know, I wish I could remove stress out of life. I wish I could, but it's never going to happen. Life is stressful for all of us, right? So we have to get in there and start teaching our kids how to cope with the difficulties, how to manage anxiety, how to manage all of that, because it's, right. it's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. I also want to comment on what you said about trauma too. I feel like when people hear that, when they hear the word trauma, they go to all the biggies oh, yeah. and it's not trauma in, in even post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not necessarily a big event. It can be just trying to live in this world with chronic anxiety. That is very traumatic for a 12 or a 13 year old. And to be just a gentle, empathetic kind of feeling person. Sometimes those yeah. people, they struggle hard. It's harder for them. So it, it impacts them more. But you know what I really hate is that they just, like a lot of people want to say that. And then it's more of finger pointing, I think. Yeah. Oh, it must be the family. They weren't, they weren't what happened in that family. child and what happened in that family. And that's just not what happened. <laughs> it, you know? it's frequently not it's not it's you know I think I see families struggle with this all the time what did I do wrong and that is such a big part of the savior thing right like a lot of parents own where their their child has has gotten in their substance use and it's not necessarily the parent I mean sometimes it is sometimes there's major traumas right. that happen Absolutely. in households right but that is not the case across the board and no. this world is a hard place to live in and if you are a child that feels deeply or is stuck in your head and can't communicate or just starts using at an early age before the brain is fully developed, right? Early drug use, we know this, it primes the brain for future drug use because once the brain gets hold of it, it doesn't develop coping skills, right? So, um, so, so it, it literally primes the brain and the brain starts to say, move towards this drug, move to, at a very early age, right? So it's, um, you know, you know, it, what I see, you know what I see too, is I see that families, it, it just like when, when everybody's doing that finger pointing, a lot of times families will be like, I did the best I could. I have three other kids and they're fine. So it, you know, why are you why are you putting it on me and then they're not able to be there for their loved one that they really need to be there for because this person is struggling because they get defensive because everybody's pointing their fingers at them because we're human <laughs> so if we if we unwind that whole myth that it must have been something you did instead of maybe you just have like i did and do the sweetest kid in the whole world and the world just bothers her and it always did and she's gentle and, 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 you know, when people were mean to her, it, she internalized it and it became easier to get along if she just, you know, went up, smoked a little pot in the beginning or did a little drinking and it just got out of control. Yeah. And that's another thing I've recognized. It seems to, to me that the, some of the kindest souls, the people who feel the hardest and the deepest are the ones that get sucked down the hardest, um, by substance use disorder. And I think that's also because how many times, Maureen, have you had a family say, but they're really a good person. He was really, yeah, yeah I know. I believe you. I believe, <laughs> I've seen it. I, I, it's, the, it's the best of the best. And that's why we can't afford to lose any of those people. We have to take care of them. I agree. We do have a question. I am the mother of an addict. Uh, I am doing the work, but no one else in my family is. This was actually something I thought of. I'm glad you asked this question because I was going to bring it up earlier and I get sidetracked. Um, they keep blaming and fighting. How can I get them to take steps towards healing? Um, so I'm just going to, you know, my, my, I have a standard answer for any of these things, which is who's the only person that you can control? <laughs> you knew I was going to say the that. same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't, unfortunately, but hopefully you lead by example, right? You yeah. do, you do what you have to do for yourself. You can't make anybody do anything. No, there's some great books out there. Maureen's is one of them. Um, you know, if you love me, there's Saving Jake, which is another great one. Um, you know, it, these books, if, if you leave them out on the coffee table or read them and mention them in conversation, not forced conversation, but, oh, I was reading this and this book the other day, and it really touched me. And maybe things like that can be helpful. I think the more that we try to force, oftentimes the more we push people in the other direction. 
Yes. So, but I, another, another interesting point to this, which comes up frequently, and I know you dealt with this too, Maureen, is what happens when you start to do the work and you start to learn and you start to pull back, right? If you were the person for lack of a better term, who is enabling, I don't, I say that with all of the love and no judgment at all, because I myself have done it. Um, when you're the person that starts to pull back and you learn and you start to put boundaries around them and all of this stuff, oftentimes if they're not ready to get better, what do they do? They just find somebody else to come in to take your place. Yeah. And it, it makes, it makes loved ones crazy. And I've, I lived it too with my ex-husband. Um, it was when I left him within two weeks, he moved a new woman into our home because I had left and she stepped in and she started to enabling to enable him. I'd been with him for 15 years. Right. So this is what this is. It's part of the disease when they're not ready to get better. And I, I often hear from families, what can I do to get this person away? And what can you do? You, you can't, you have to just hold your own, own boundaries and, 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 you know, do what you need to do. And hopefully it, it, you know, at some point they'll realize, but you know, it's um, yeah, I, it's, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. There's not a lot you have to, I think there's such, such importance in understanding what you can, what you do and you don't have control over. Yes. You can't make anybody do anything. No, nope. including somebody else that's going to come in. But um, I mean, I always love when I'm working with people to teach them a lot of the, 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 those good or motivational interviewing skills. Yeah. And, and to ask questions when someone says, you know, when they're going to do something that, you know, is enabling, you know, they're stepping in where you're not going to do it. Well, if you're not going to give them the keys to the car, I'm going to. I mean, it, how did that work out last time? Why do you think that would be any different this time? Instead of having the big screaming fight about not doing something or giving somebody money, well, you know, what what good do you what good will come out of this? What do you think is gonna is gonna happen? What happened last time? Just making people think about what they're doing instead of telling them, because when you start telling people, you're you're enabling, you're doing this, you're doing that, instead of instead of helping them to understand how this always looks because we get into that pattern of that we can't break you know so in this woman's situation where she's doing things she can only do what she can do and she can only act in in a healthy way and as an example to everybody else and hopefully they'll see that that is a much better way to do it Mm -hmm. and then maybe ask them what do you what do you what do you think you're getting out of this what what do you think the way you're doing things How will that keep, how will that get us to where we want to be? Right. Absolutely. We don't want them to use yet. You keep giving them 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. So, and they keep using it to buy drugs. What is the, what do you think will be different this time? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's a, I think we get so angry that we end up putting a wedge between us and the other person where a much better approach is try to, trying to align with them in a gentle way. Um, because that's the only way someone's going to listen, right? Have you ever listened to anybody that was yelling or angry or you don't hear anything that's being said when that's the discussion, when it's not a discussion, when it's a screaming match, no one hears anything, no change gets made there. Right. But when you can do what you said and you can work towards and and sometimes it's I don't want to align with this person. I can't stand them so much. Right. Right, But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself the following question. And trust me, this is one of my regular mantras that I have to say in my head all the time. Do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? Because oftentimes those things are at odds. You can't be both. So. I have to, sometimes you have to take a breath and walk away. And I think when it comes to all of this space is one of the most underutilized strategies we have. You're not going to be able to figure this out in a moment when you're angry and you're triggered. You got to take some space from it, walk away, take a breath, do some self-reflection, think about what, what's worked in the past. How can I do it differently? And then come forward and have the discussion and try to align with the people in your life because the people in their lives, because if you hate the person that's an enabling or the person that's in there using with them or, or whatever, you're actually pushing your loved one further away from you. You're not helping at all. 
the today. attitude that we all love this person and we want them to be well. And my favorite question to ask is, and how will we know when, when this, this isn't working? How will we know? And what will we do? Even if, you know, what, even if you don't agree with the person and what they're doing, even more so when you don't agree with them, well, okay, you're going to do this. How will we know when it isn't working? Yeah. And, and what will we do about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I often say to people, I think you said this earlier, um, it, you know, how about we try something different this time? Because if we're going to do the same thing over and over again and expect a, a different result, I mean, I think somebody once said that was the definition of insanity, right? Yep. Um, we have to move forward and just, so that's always my, my best advice to a family is please just do something differently. Just do it differently. Whatever you did last time, if it didn't work, figure out a different strategy this time. I think we just got a question, Maureen. Do you want to sure. read this one? Oh, well, sure. Um, my son is 46 years old and an alcoholic. Is there hope for him? Mm -hmm. Always. My mother got sober in her 60s. So, um, I mean, I think that there's always hope. Always. Every day. And it's okay for us to, to lose hope sometimes because this is a really difficult disease, um, but find your own support system and work through that because I think it's incredibly important that I always, in my head, I picture myself carrying a little lantern of light and I'm the hope carrier, right? And I have to even, and there are days where it's tough and there are days where it's hard and there are days where I'm like, I don't think this person's going to win the battle. Um, and I have to check myself and I have to go to my support system and work through my own feelings around that. And I get that it's a deadly disease. So oftentimes families have to prepare themselves for the worst because it is what it is. We have to face that reality, right? But as long as there's breath, there is hope always. And the more Maureen was talking about her journey with her daughter, the more people around them that believe in them, that don't do things for them, but believe they can do for themselves and believe that they're capable, right? The more we're building them up to start to believe it. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of people tell me there's no, this is not, you, you need to get ready because this is not going to uh, end well. Um, and people that cared about me, they weren't trying to hurt me. They were trying to get me to, and first of all, I don't think, you know, we, we, you can never get ready for that. I know enough people that have lost children. You can never be ready for that. And why should you be if they're still here? Right. Because that just means that they're still here. Um, but I had lots of people tell me, you know, this is this is not going to end well because she was just in such rough shape, and they were wrong. Yeah. So if you know, she just brought she brought more life into the world five weeks ago, <laughs> right? And and even she didn't think she even she didn't have a lot of hope, and she was wrong. So I just don't I just don't believe that there's ever a time where we say, you know what, we got we got to accept the fact that this is no. Because every day you wake up in the morning is still a chance. And when things change for her, and I see this all the time, they didn't change like, oh, this is the time. If I had a dollar for every time I said, oh, this is the time, this is the one, it's and, and, time. and I was wrong, right? Yeah. But it, the, when it actually did start to change, it was, it was slow and bumpy, and it didn't look any different than any other time. Right. So it there's no like... I guess some people have like a magic thing. Don't even say rock bottom to me because rock bottom to me is dead. I know, and I don't mean you. I, I know you wouldn't say that. Never. Because I don't believe in rock bottom. It's ridiculous. She had about 20 rock bottoms. But, um, you know, I think that uh, it, 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 we want to, some people may get that like moment and then everything changes. But for the most part, they just, they just realize, holy Christmas, it's actually working. I'm doing it. And then they keep doing it and then it keeps going. And then before you know it, somebody, everybody gave up on is, um, but it's so important that there's at least one person that, yeah, and that, that they have that is, that beliefs in them. And when people say, so, cause you know, I mean, what we talk about is pulling back, right. Is not fixing everything for your loved one, which feels for families oftentimes like they're doing nothing, but in reality, that, that is doing the most. If you can step back and you can stop fixing and you can start to carry the hope. And by the way, when you're not the fixer, it's easier to carry the hope. I just want to throw it, that out there. When you have to fix, when it's your job to fix every mistake or every, you know, trauma that comes your way, you get very resentful. You get very angry, right? It's hard to have hope and not just be 
always anxious and angry, right? But when you can take a step back and their consequences are theirs and not yours, right? It's much easier to be, to, to carry that lantern. And the whole idea of rock bottom, like, let's talk about that for a second, because I hear that term still all the time. And I wouldn't, I don't, it, it's not, it makes no sense, right? We don't want to wait till somebody has lost everything in order to help them, right? But what you just said is, is really key. What, what typically I see starts to happen is the drug stops working, first of all. Okay, so in other words, the pain, the drug, your loved ones all started using drugs and alcohol because it removed pain. It worked for them. And we have to acknowledge that at some point in their life, it probably saved their life. It probably did. It helped them survive some really difficult times. And I know that's hard to see, but if we don't acknowledge that with them, we're not getting anywhere because to them, this drug was a vital part of their successes. Okay. The problem is at some point drugs stop, drugs and alcohol stops helping and starts hurting right? That's the downside. It's the best friend. It's the best friend, right? That becomes the enemy. So eventually what happens for most people is the pain is there, whether they're using or they're not. Okay. So that's when the magic starts to happen is that it stops removing the pain. The only way we can get the person to be, to still have a level of discomfort and pain while they're using as if they're facing consequences of their use, right? So that's why we don't want to remove those. I have, I like to think of it as a scale where one side is the pain of active use and one side is the pain of recovery and sobriety. Your loved ones are in so much pain when they're sober, so much. That's why they use, right? Human nature. I'm in pain. Your, your brain, your nervous system can't tell the difference between psychic pain or physical pain. So no matter what pain it is, The second that that pain comes, brain says, go use the drug, go use the drug, go use the drug. And that's all subconscious. So they move towards the drug and then they get a reprieve from the pain. Okay. As family members, we don't, we have forced to sit in that pain 24 seven because we're not actively using. That's why when we go, I don't understand why haven't they got it yet? That's why, because they're, they're not even remembering a lot of the things that are happening while they're active. You are, but they're not. And then the memories come flooded back when they're sober, which makes sober even more painful. Okay. So this is the stuff we always have to remember. Yet they still have to stay sober. Right. Right. They still have to stay. So yeah, right. It's, they still have to stay sober in, in, in order to get into recovery, which is where the magic happens. They have to be sober. Sober is incredibly painful. So what we need to do is we need the brain to start to go, oh my God, this drug's not helping anymore. Okay. This drug is causing me pain, right? So the con that's the conscious part of the brain, the subconscious part of the brain's driving them to use the conscious part of the brain needs to start kicking in to go, Oh my gosh, this is not, this might not be true. This might not be helping. This might be causing me more pain. So they're actually fighting their brain. Their, their brain is fighting itself. Like when I, is that part of the brain that holds on to memories of first use and when it felt better, not on the memories of when you woke up in a ditch, that's not the memory that it's holding on to. It's memory, the memory, your brain is holding on to the memory of that relief. Yes. And that's what we don't understand. Like that's the part that I think more people need to learn about because that's, that's what drives people back to use, even though And that's the subconscious, right? right? And that's the part that makes it even more complicated because it's the subconscious that remembers that memory. The conscious brain does remember the ditch, but guess who speaks first? The subconscious, right? You guys, we're doing things subconsciously all the time without knowing it. I mean, just breathing. Do you think about breathing? No, you don't think about it. And every once in a while you start to think about it and then you're like, oh my God, I can't breathe, right? Like the subconscious and the conscious brain are in two separate places. They're not directly related to each other. So what has to happen is the craving comes to use and then the conscious brain has to kick in and go, hold on a second. I'm not sure if that's a good idea because we woke up in a ditch last time, right? But this, that requires time and treatment and healing and all of that stuff to get there. That's learning. That's, that is essentially what treatment is, is strengthening. I I think I told just before, I like to think of the subconscious as a devil and the conscious brain. So the subconscious is like the amygdala, the midbrain, the conscious brain is the cortex, right? So the midbrain devil, 
cortex angel and what treatment does when you have an active use, the devil's huge angels, tiny. What treatment does is try to shrink the devil and grow the angel. Right. So, but that's really difficult to do when people are in their lives. This is what people often tell me, well, can they do it just by going to uh, a couple meetings a week and, you know, continuing to go to work and continuing to stay in their home? Can they? Yeah. People have done it. I would say very few, if you're talking about severe substance use disorder, because you can't, you can't, you can't cure cancer without going and getting treatment, right? This disease is similar. People need help and it's not a moral and ethical failing. It's biology. Absolutely. And when they look into our our eyes and we've given up or we're not healthy enough to, to be that rock and that strong person, which is what I learned. Right. Yeah. How did, how do they do all that? Because it really, when you think about it, it's, it feels almost impossible yet people do it all the time. 23 million people in active recovery. Right. But when they can look into a, when a person hasn't given up, when you've made yourself as a family member strong, you've made yourself solid, you're a rock, you know where, where you end and they begin, you know what you have control over, what you don't have control over, and you know that no matter what happens, you love them and you'll never stop loving them and you can show them that. I'm here, I'm still here, I believe in you. When you can present that instead of, I don't think you're going to be able to do this, it's yeah. a, a world of difference. Or- that's why we have to take care of ourselves. Or how about this, right? And I'm speaking from my own personal experience here. How about the nasty arguments mm-hmm. where we say things like loser or swears or, you know, and I'm, again, there's no judgment here because I did it. I did it as an, as a and wife, I did it. You know, the, the taking us down with them. So people yeah. get angry. We're only human. Right. And that's what I was going to say. It's, it's, totally normal to, to react like that. Right. But when we can put up the proper boundaries, right. Mm -hmm. I run two spousal support groups and this is a group. I see parents do it too, but spouses tend to be the ones that get the most angry. Oftentimes that use uh, attack, right. You signed up for this. Exactly. It's not, you gave birth to them. (laughs) Right. It's like, I knew you when you, like, I didn't, I didn't know you when you didn't know how to use a fork. Like this was not what I expected when I met you. Right. So there's, it it creates a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. You're, you're usually sitting there taking care of the household and the children and the finances and the ship's going down and you're doing more than your share to write it. And you're, you're, you're not getting anywhere. So you get really angry. Right. So this is where the, that idea of boundaries comes in. It's really hard to do what, Maureen is suggesting, even though we know that's what works, if you're not putting boundaries around your loved one, you have to figure out. And sometimes in my case, it meant I had to remove from bank accounts, regardless of how angry he got. I had to take him off my insurance policy to protect myself, regardless of how angry he got. Um, I had to not allow time with our child because it wasn't safe, regardless of how angry he got. And there's oftentimes domestic violence issues that are associated with putting these boundaries up. So you also have to make sure you're keeping yourself safe and you're calling 911 because guess what's another natural consequence of the use? When we talk about the scale, we want it to tip in favor of the pain of sobriety as opposed to the pain of active use, right? So we have to pile on the consequences on the side of active use. And if he's bullying or she's bullying or she's threatening or he's threatening, what happens in our society when people are, or that's, that's what you do. So you got to call, you got to hold them accountable. Cause you and that's, them. that can't come out of anger either. It's got to exactly. come out of the, the, and that's why the taking care of yourself, it's got to come out of the logic and the reasoning, not manipulation, not punishment, not anger. And that's a hard place to get when all that's going on. Right. Yep. Just it, just, just absolutely. Absolutely. And it just happened to me. Um, my ex-husband who has never been fully sober. So he got off opiates years ago and I don't know the extent of his use because I have not been with him for 10 years, um, but just ended up back in rehab recently. And guess what I was getting via text messages while he was, I was getting all the same stuff that I used to get 
10 years ago, right? Because that's what the unwell brain does. And trust me, I teach people this. And in my, I wanted to fire back, <laughs> like I'm here keeping our son safe, keeping all the wheels on the bus and have been for many years. And I wanted to fire back. I had to take space, even as a therapist who has been doing this work and teaching this work now for a long time, I had to put my phone down and I had to go take a breath because I was going to fire back something that was really not nice. So, and, you know, so this is not easy. So what you're mm-hmm. telling to do people to, to, to what we're telling people to do is not easy. And we recognize that, that. Yes, because it, but it's having the tools and the, and the roadmap of the knowing tool. what to do. And you have to follow it just like anybody else. I do. I put the phone down. I came back to it. And my response was, you know, we will talk about this once you've done some work. You know, and I, 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 I genuinely hope you get better. Like, I hope I'm glad you're there and I hope you get better. And that, and, and that was, and then I just stopped responding, but again, it wasn't easy. No. And, to, and so having the support and having the support groups and having a counselor and having all those things in place just makes it, it, it makes it so that you know what the roadmap is. It doesn't make it exactly. any, not necessarily any easier to keep okay. doing it. It's still really hard. This is all really, really hard. Right. Because we're humans and we're not supposed to be perfect. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a goal. I often call, (laughs) I call this rainbows and unicorns land. Um, Maureen, when I'm working with people, I'm always like, okay, well in rainbows and unicorns land, you will be able to respond in this capacity. Right. So rainbows and unicorns land is the goal. Um, that we're always working towards, but trying not to, cause I have families that will be like, I know this and I, I didn't, I did this instead. And then they get so mad at themselves and that just takes energy away from um, doing it differently next time. It doesn't help. It's not helpful for any of us. You know, sometimes doing things wrong opens the door to, for the person to understand that everybody does something wrong yeah. because they think that we think we don't do anything wrong sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's like, and I tell people all the time tell your loved one, I'm working on this. Yeah. I'm doing the best that I can. I make mistakes. I don't want to make any more. And that's why I'm doing this. And I, I just made another one and I need to step back and rethink that. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. And I think having a conversation with your loved one, when you're not in the heated argument or discussion and just saying, listen, I'm going to try to utilize space a little bit more when we're discussing things. Cause I don't want to hurt you anymore. And so I'm going to, if sometimes I might not respond, um, immediately, like I have in the past, I just want you to know why it's because I'm trying, I'm learning and I'm trying to do this in a kinder way for both of us. Don't we fall right into that though? Because addiction is such a disease of immediacy. I want everything now. I can fix it now. I can't feel it now. I want to feel something else now. And then we like go right into that where they ask questions, they ask for something and we're like, I got to answer them right now. Like, no, you don't. (laughs) You actually don't have to answer anybody right now. Um, Throw me a rope. I'm drowning. That's a question that requires an immediate answer. Do you have a rope? But I mean, if you're, if you're just having, if somebody wants something from you, you can always say, you know what? Give me five minutes. I need to think about that. I'll call you right back or 10 minutes or an hour or a day or whatever it is that you need. Yep. And I think the issue is that most of our loved ones, when they come to us and they're in the midst of active use, it is throw me a rope. I'm drowning. (laughs) That's what they're saying to us, right? Mm -hmm. They're making, and, and sometimes they are drowning, right? And it feels like it needs to be immediate. But again, you have to ask yourself, how much control do I have over the situation? Who created the situation and who, who should be figuring their way out, right? Because that's what's going to teach your loved ones that they're capable. If you continue to come in, it's like the two-year-old learning to tie their shoes. If you keep tying the shoe, you're just teaching the two-year-old that they can't. That's you're not teaching a, them that they can. That's such a hard concept for some, for a lot of people to get. It was a really hard concept for me to get because I felt like I was abandoning her if I didn't do things. And really what I was doing was telling her that she couldn't do it herself. Right. Yeah. So I think one of my favorite, the favorite pieces that I got from Deanne Burwell's book, Saving Jake, was that she started to say to her son, um, so, what, oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry. So what are you going to do about that? That has saved so many people in their discussions. It seems so simple. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes they'll be like, well, that's why I'm calling you in the beginning. But after a while, you know, you just say, well, I, you know, we already discussed this and 
I, I'm not going to pay your electric bill again. I'm not, I, you know, you're spending the majority of your money on, on drugs. You're probably going to have to think a little bit more about budgeting and whatnot. So, but so how are you going to do it? Like, tell me, what's your plan? How are you going to do it differently? So this doesn't keep happening. Because people, people know how, how they feel when they hear what they say, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes out of their own mouths, I guess I'm going to have to get a second job. I guess I'm going to, you know, whatever it is, is the, is whatever their answer is, they may, if you tell them what their answer is in one ear and out the other, but if they, if they resolve it, and that's when you're being helpful, when you can have that, those kind of conversations, what is it, what is that going to look like when you don't have any electricity? What do you think you're going to do? I also want to throw out there that when, you, if you start doing this, you're probably going to get a lot of swear words, insults, and, um, yeah, but we get those in the dial tones. Yeah. You get that anyway, but I hear a lot of people say this to me. Well, they're never going to talk to me again. That no, no, it's not, it's not the case. They'll be back. Okay. And you got to ask yourself if you want to help, you know, because that's, it's just not helpful to keep fixing. And also it's kind of, I say this to teenage parents and I say this to parents of people who are or families of people who have active substance use disorder is if your loved one or your teenager is always happy with you you're doing something wrong Yeah. when they're angry with you as uncomfortable as it is for us, you're probably doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So these boundaries are going to create anger and they're going to have a reaction. Really what is, what it is, is a temper tantrum. This is another metaphor that I use frequently. Um, and this is human nature, right? You bring your child into the grocery store. They want a candy bar. You buy them a candy bar. The next time you try to say no, they get more agitated. You, so you buy them another candy bar. So if this goes on for a while and eventually you're like, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. What's the child going to do? Throw a temper tantrum, going to throw a temper tantrum in the aisle. The longer you hold out and hold your no, the more intense the temper tantrum is going to get. This is human behavior. I don't care how old you are. If somebody, if somebody's doing something for you that's helpful and they just stop or they end up stopping, mm-hmm. you want them to go back to the way that they went before, especially if you haven't done a lot of work on yourself. I did a lot of this in my twenties, right? You want it to go back to the way that it was, was before. Cause that was working for you. So you're going to get angry. You might, you're going to try to push it to go back to what was comfortable. This stuff. Um, Yeah. Comfortable. Yeah. This stuff was working for them. It's not working for you. So you have to anticipate that it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's the worst thing in the world for you, right? It's comfortable. It's the known. And we always, we always feel more safer and more comfortable in the known. Yeah. Even when it's bad. Yeah. It's the story of the lobster. Have you, have I told you the story? It's kind of, I used to say it all the time and then I lost it for a little while and I'm, I'm, I'm back. I kind of brought it back into my, (laughs) my repertoire. So the lobster, um, the only way that it knows it can't grow in its shell, right? Because the shell is confining. So the only way that it knows that it needs to grow is that it becomes uncomfortable in its shell. There's pain involved, right? It's cramped in there. It starts to hurt. So it goes down to the bottom of the ocean floor. It sheds its shell. And while it's down there, it's incredibly vulnerable because it's down there with no shell. It's a really uncomfortable, scary place for it to be has to do that though, before it can build a new shell and be able to go back on with its life. Right. I don't think we're any different, right? We become uncomfortable. The pain comes, we're uncomfortable in our shell. That means it's time to grow for most mm-hmm. of us. We think it's like an that. awful thing, but it's really growth. Right. So we then have to shed our shell, which is this pattern that we've been carrying with us. that's not working for us anymore. And guess what? Then we end up on the bottom of the ocean floor, incredibly vulnerable. It's scary. We don't know what to do. Sometimes we want to go back and we try to go back, but that shell just still doesn't feel comfortable, right? But you don't quite know yet what to do. You haven't built a new shell yet, right? So you sit down there and then eventually you will find a new pattern. You will grow another shell and it will be way more comfortable and you'll be able to go on, right? But that process is painful. And what we're talking about here today is that it's that transformation. It's that going from old pattern that's not working to new pattern that's going to bring us more joy in life and more well-adjusted and more positive outcomes, but it's hard. I like that. I like that. That's a great way to explain it. Yeah. Well, I can't believe that was an hour. That was an hour. I know. 
<laughs> I love talking to you. I know, me too. We always say the same things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says about us that we like. <laughs> took well, a lot of years to come up with these things <laughs> i know but i love it when i thought there's a every once in a while there's a few people that i find and we say the same things and we came up with it entirely out yeah. of our own personal experience and education right so. Yeah, because it works these are the things that really work yeah and that are helpful and that god i wish i knew when i was going through this in the beginning you know i would have loved to have listened to this and just like soaked everything up in the very beginning i think it would have been so much less painful so much less, so much less painful. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, uh, in the field, Maureen, when I was going through it and nobody Some, still know. never heard any yeah. of this. Well, we stuff. all know that there's a lot of people in the field that still don't get this. Yeah, there are. There's a lot of people that wind up coming to us because they mm -hmm. dealt with people that don't get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm sad that this is the end, but it's not the end. It's a transformation. We're the lobster, right? We are the lobster. <laughs> this medium wasn't working anymore. So now we're going to, we're going to try this something new. This is good. So I will um, let you know about the podcast and for everybody out there, please, um, you know, follow us on social media, Heron Project, and there'll be info on how you're, you'll be able to connect with us. I have no idea how to connect to a podcast because I am 1994 in action every day. <laughs> So, um, but when the people that understand these things, <laughs> it will be up on all of our social media and I don't, you want to touch upon Magnolia? Um, yeah, I mean, we're still, you know, going strong. There's Magnolia meetings and, um, at through spectrum and a couple of other places and, um, I'm doing family coaching and available to that. And, um, I can be, you know, you can find me. I'm kind of everywhere, but it's Magnolia yeah, Resources um, and Magnolia New Beginnings. Okay, awesome. And you can find all information on Heron Project on heronproject.org. Um, Heron's H-E-R-R-E-N. And we also offer um, a lot of family resources, including support groups. Yes, you so. do. Okay, Maureen, right. lovely awesome. seeing you. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.